Hey, welcome to the middle bar. I am lucky enough, as you can tell, to be with uh, one half of Trivium. Uh, these guys in the, in the country, obviously, to play uh, a whole bunch of shows with Disturbed. Uh, Corey, Matt, welcome along. Yeah, thanks yeah. for having us. Yeah, no problem, man. Thanks, thanks for you guys coming all the way down here. Of course, yeah. yeah we, this is our third trip now of this country, so... Hopefully we'll start getting more. We've done five Australia, so we've got to catch up a little bit here. Yeah, 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 because yeah. I, I think first show was a big big day out. Yep, and all our gear blew up during Like Late to the Flies, and the crowd kept singing the part, parts <laughs> of the song, which was really cool. So it's a good sign of things to come. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. And I remember, too, you guys did an absolutely mind-blowing version of uh, Master of Puppets as well, I think. Did we play that that no, day? I, I think, I think you did. I th- I'm <laughs> Probably. Probably. Sounds sure. about right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, was, that was great. Yeah. Sounds used about right. used to bust, like, half the song out every yeah. once in a while, but... Now you guys been uh, real busy working on a new record, and uh, we're looking at possibly like an August release, maybe. Yes, we've been. We started. We got done touring uh, end of March last year, and uh, pretty much just we were at home the whole time up until like a week before we left uh, for the Australian tour. Um, just we were writing for like the first part of like all last year, and then starting like January through like like second week of March. Um, we were recording the whole time, so we, like we finished the record, and then like like six days later, we we're on a plane to go to uh, Australia. So we've been busy. Yeah, you've been <laughs> yeah. real busy. Yeah, the, the record, I guess, we've been working on parts of it for the last, year, I think, almost like a year to year and a half. Demoed for like six or eight months and recorded for what two or three. It was like two, two probably two and a half months of just tracking. Yeah. And the record so. kept getting pushed. Like we we're supposed, to, it was supposed to be out by like June or July, and we didn't end up starting until way, way, way late. Just things kept happening. So. But it's finally done, and it's, it's really great. Cool. Well, that, that's a long time, you know, I guess, between between records, but it's also a long time to to be writing and to be demoing. How many songs would you typically end up with, you know, that aren't obviously not all going to make the record, but how many songs are you, have you demoed? I think on average, per record, there's usually about anywhere from, like, 13 to 15 songs, because when you actually go into the studio to record it, you know, there's a lot, lot to do to, to record all the music and the vocals and just get everything perfect for the uh, the actual album but I think when we were actually demoing it we varied from like we'd start with like maybe like 30 song ideas and kind of like get rid of the ones that we didn't really feel like were that good and then we actually were like jamming like anywhere from like 20 to 25 songs and we just kind of would drop songs that we felt that weren't you know we kind of focused in on like the more we played and the more we realized which songs were going to be like the ones we wanted to focus on and that had the direction that we were looking for for the for the, the overall record so we kind of just kept whittling it down and then we actually went into the studio we had 13 songs that we felt were all really killer so we, we rolled with that excellent and do, how do you I mean like last record obviously Shogun had um, you know reflecting I guess some of your heritage there Matt had you know had a, a theme as it were with, with the samurai thing um, <clears throat> is there a theme for this record and do you come up with a theme straight away and then go we're gonna write a record about this or do you get a bunch of songs start some writing and then see what the feel is and, and come up with a theme based off that. With this album, there's going to be no right or wrong interpretation the way anyone sees it. Um, it's something that I definitely wanted to go into it with that, like I said, there was, there's no right or wrong answer, that the people, that, that really the definition of the song, of the album, of the artwork, of everything is in like the ear and the eye of the beholder because we're pretty much, every single thing was a conscious effort this time. This new record it wasn't just the music, it was also the art and logo and website and merchandise and look and, you know, obviously that stuff hasn't happened yet because the record's not out yet, but once the new record's out, every single thing has, is, has been worked on and everyone will see that it's not going to just be the normal metal art anymore. It's not just going to be standard band photos or standard music videos. It's going to be a whole new world and um, I really want to see what people interpret that as and what they make it because it means something for each one of us differently in the band and you know some of the songs that I've, I've passed around the meanings to the other guys in the band but not too much because I still want everyone to be able to make up what they feel like it is and I feel like if I give um, too much of an indication before someone goes into it they might walk into it with a preconceived idea of okay this is supposed to mean this but I don't want anything that's supposed to mean anything so yeah okay that's a, I'm intrigued <laughs> because th- th- this is kind of taking the whole the whole um the whole being in a band thing to a, to, a, to a new level, which I guess you're seeing more and more with um, the state of the music industry at the moment and where, where the music industry is going. Um, so that as an artist, you're feeling now that uh, from what I'm picking up is we're not just going to deliver you a record, but we're going to deliver you a whole experience. Exactly, exactly. Because that's something I feel like, you know, when I look at the standard metal video, it there, there isn't as much that goes into it as some of these bands that like 
indie bands, for example, have some of the coolest, strangest videos I've ever seen, but musically it's like, man, visually it's intense, but musically it's not. Why, why aren't metal bands doing this? Why isn't it going to the next extreme? So I think uh, we're going we're to attempt to do that now and to take everything as a creative decision and not just you know, make the album and hire a guy to do the cover two weeks before the record needs to come out and say, all right, get it done. Yeah. And um, this time we've been working on the art, uh, you know, us and, and the guy who's, who's really putting it all together. Um, we've been working on it for almost about a year now, which is the art for the record. So Wow, and, that's, and, a, that's almost as long as you've been working on the record. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Now, uh, Corey, um, with the writing process, I know I've, I've been reading uh, reading a few things. I, I see that the writing process for this album maybe have changed a bit, and, the, and there's a bit more input from other members of the band as well. Um, well, every record that we've done, like Apollo, Matt, and I always, you know, everyone just writes as many riffs or song ideas as possible, and we all trade them around and give each other tips and whatever. But uh, this one was a little bit different just because working with Nick, like, he's, we can work quicker. Like, he's got, like, the same kind of, like, brain as the rest of us when it comes to music that, like, right. one of us could, like, Matt could show me a riff and, like, the rest of us can, like, you know, absorb it really quick. We can start jamming on the song ideas and Nick, you know, we could show him a riff or show him a demo and he'll come right in and, like, it was pretty amazing because we'd give him, like, a demo of, like, guitar riffs, like a song idea and just, we'd program, like, drums and stuff, like, the, the demos and stuff, but we'd give him the, the track with with no drums on it, it's just guitar riffs, and we'll just go into practice, and we'll be able to just play through the whole song, like the first time we played it, wow. which we've never really ha had been able to do that before, and uh, and then it just kind of makes getting the the bulk of the work out of the way of being able to to play the music together, and then we can kind of get to the fine details and tuning the songs and getting them really put together a lot quicker. So we had a lot more time to kind of like fine tune everything because all the kind of like just learning the tunes was kind of uh, gotten out of the way a lot quicker, so it uh, really helped us with uh, all the details of the music to get it to like where we really felt that everything is really cohesive and Nick's playing off the guitar parts more than we've ever had in our music where everything's just the detail between the drums and you know and the guitar parts is, is way more in depth than any other record we've had, so we feel it like having that ability, like it's really kind of brought like a new aspect into our music and just like a the creativeness into it, it's a lot more in depth. So uh, I think when everyone hears it, they'll, they'll, they'll kind of know what I'm talking about, but it's, it's pretty cool. Like we had a lot of fun just going in and playing and, and just putting this music together. And I think just having that much fun as a group and just kind of jamming and playing, like it really comes across in the music as being very energetic and intense and, and a lot of fun to listen to. Sweet. Okay, and well that kind of, I was actually going to ask you, so I'll, I'll throw this one to you Matt, the difference between, you know, um, obviously Nick's fitting in well because he's still there, right? So the difference between recording a record with Nick and, and your previous drummer Travis, I mean, is it a marked difference you find it? You, fa you found it? I, I've had a lot of people ask, you know, obviously the biggest question is what's the band like now, how is it having Nick in the band and what the, why the lineup changed and all this stuff, but, but really the best analogy I've been able to describe it as is that when we brought Nick into the band and when we started playing with Nick and running with Nick, it felt like we were a brand new band. Like we were a bunch of people from, you know, the same hometown that said, hey, let's start making music together and we were recording our first demo. That's what it felt like. We were off for so long, we were off for a year that I forgot what it was like to tour and what it was like to play shows. And, you know, I almost, I remember I was still in the band, but it's like, it felt like a complete refresh when we got in. When he was officially, I mean, he was officially in, you know, the tour right before that break. But at that time when we were home, we were able to digest it and really, really figure it out. And uh, it's just, there's, there's, no, there's no limitations. You know, we can do whatever we want to do. And I, I, I wish the album was out now so everyone can hear it, but I think it's also good that we get to test you know, a couple of our ideas before the album comes out, like what we're doing live, what we're doing visually, and all this stuff. And uh, yeah, it just feels like we're a brand new band, like we're a local band who's going on our first couple tours, but they just happen to be in front of 10,000 people, so. <laughs> <laughs> and how is that touring with, uh, you know, I mean, like we said, you know, you've been here previously, one was a festival, one was your own show at Power Station, which holds like maybe 1,200, 1,500 people. Now you're doing, um, you know, an arena show with, with Disturbed. Um, how do you find that difference and, and how is it touring with Disturbed? It's, uh, it's been amazing. We've actually like had a couple opportunities, like, you know, Disturbed, like we met, uh, David Draymond came out to one of our shows like even before I think Ascendancy came out we we're opening for like Danzig and he actually liked us back then and 
and we've kind of like gotten every once in a while like we got asked to open for him on a tour like years ago but it was like a Jägermeister tour we weren't old enough to be on it right so we've kind of like had these chances to play with them but like it just never seemed to work out right and then this tour came up and we were really stoked and uh, you know, we've met the guys a few times here and there in European festivals and everyone's always been super cool and touring with them has been amazing it's been probably like for being such a big tour and arenas and stuff it's been probably like one of the most like relaxed environments for like a tour and all those guys are just super cool and it's really nice and you know you know it's been it's been a really great tour for not being on tour for a year <laughs> to come out and being on such a like a really cool tour their crew's awesome the guys in the bands are awesome and uh it's just a you know a great experience for us to have and have the opportunity to especially in a country like australia where we've we've done pretty well and it keeps getting better to have like you know we've never done like a, a support tour like like this and you know, playing those shows, the reactions were amazing. And I think that really, you know, playing with them really opened us to like a new audience. And hopefully, the same thing will happen here, where we get exposed to a lot of people that would probably like us, but just never had a chance to hear us. And then, you know, just kind of grow our, I guess, our fan base here. So it's been it's been an amazing time. That's great. Yeah, and it's one of the best best we've ever been treated on a tour before. It's really good. There's like no stage space limitations. There's no decibel limit limitations. There's no catering limitations. There's no security limitations. It's it's really cool. They treat us really well. And, and we've I remember I was telling the bass player John, and I was like, man, we've never been treated this well on a tour this size. So thank you. Yeah. And yeah, it's a really cool thing. Oh, that's great. That's great. Now I know you brought in Colin Richardson to work on the new record, and he's done with you know obviously Bullet uh, from the Valentine and Machine Head Fear Factory. Slipknot. Uh, was there a reason that you picked him? And and if so, you know what what have you found? different working with him that he's brought to the table in my in our minds we've always felt like the two best metal producers in the world are Colin Richardson and Andy Sneap right um, we've never had either of them produce a record before we've had both of them mix records of ours before um, I think it was just through being such fans of Colin that we wanted to see what he can do like we knew he's a, is a he's a killer producer and I guess there was like a three-year lull when people only hired him to mix where he's actually just a badass producer as well so we want to see what he can do with us and one of his main things was that he was so meticulous with tone and with setting things up. We've never seen anything like that. I mean, we, we came into it where metal started getting the new school way of recording with metal. And the way you do that is you, you, know, you plug into a shitty amp farm, guitar tone on Pro Tools, send it, and hopefully when it gets mixed and mastered, the guy makes it sound better. But Colin doesn't even like to start recording a note until you have the guitar tone of the album. Right. So, I mean, drum tones took four and a half days to get a good drum tone. Guitar tones, including technical difficulties and having to fire a studio and relocate, took about four or five days just to get a guitar wow. tone. We tried, I think, 20 heads and 10 cabs and 20 guitars and all this stuff. And uh, it was really great to see how much effort he puts in everything before you even start. And he doesn't really ever lose his patience. You know, I'm, I've, I've always I've told him that I've admired his patience a lot. I mean, I'm not that kind of a patient guy. I'm not as patient as he is, and it's amazing how much detail they all put into it. But um. It was actually Colin Richardson and uh, Martin Ginge Ford from Skindred and Dub War, who also key co-produced the record with Colin. Cool. And then Carl Brown, Carl Bound, doesn't have an R in his last name. Carl Bound engineered the record, and uh, it was really fun recording with them. And if they'd be up for it, I would love to have them again for another record. It was really good. Sweet. Yeah. Oh no, was, I thought you had something there, Corey. Oh. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. He's just, he's, you know, you've obviously mixed the last couple records, and he actually we talked to him about doing Shogun. But I think now, like, it was kind of like the perfect storm because, like, the way we are now as a band, like, maybe the way Colin works, if we did, like, any other record with him, it might not have, like, really turned out that good. Like, as far as, because he's kind of like the guy that it's, like, he doesn't go in there and, like, he can take, like, a shitty band and, like, make you amazing. Like, it's like you have to ha be on your shit. You have to be, you know, be able to play your stuff because he can take your ability as a band and what your sound is and, and capture it like the best you can possibly sound. And you know, he makes your playing come across a certain way and like you can really capture your band. And I feel like now that we're stronger than we've ever been and you know, we've been playing our asses off the last year, we went in there and just were like, everyone was just on fire as far as playing is concerned. So he was able to just get the best possible sound out of, out of everybody. And uh, it was just like, you know, when we were hearing back just the raw tracks and I think even he was surprised at how just good everything just sonically sounded on just like the very lowest, like nothing done to it, just yeah. like the raw sounds. And it's, uh, you know, we're really excited. You know, we're just like chomping at the bit because they've been working on the mixing and stuff. And it's just going to be, you know, I know what they are, they're capable of doing and just, you know, can't wait to hear what they, they do to like the final the final outcome of the, of the songs and stuff. So it's going to be really exciting and it's easily, you know, 
even before it was mixed, it's like the best sounding album we've we've done. Cool. And so. from a technical point of view, if you like, you said you tried, you know, twenty different cabs, ten different heads. What you do in the studio, obviously, is different to what you do live. But how much does that affect if you're going to go out and play this new record on the next tour? Does that mean you've got to change your on gear, on, on stage gear? I think we're uh, we're already set on gear for. We can pretty much recreate anything that we're playing on the album, like easy. So. I don't think we'll have a problem doing that. We didn't do anything crazy as far as sound effects or any weird shit that it's like you have to have like backup tracks to do. But uh, um, just as far as music goes, it's pretty pretty bare bones. Just like you know, it's just us as a band. Like there's no keyboards or any fluffed up shit thrown in the background. <laughs> it's just it's just you know two guitars, bass, drums, and you know vocals. So it's pretty bare bones. And then the only other thing we got really really whacked out was uh, Matt Matt doing all the uh, they're doing all these intros and outros and stuff that just kind of really did some really interesting stuff that I've never even like they came up with some weird shit to, like layer into these big like orchestrated like interludes and intros and outros that are just sound just fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool man, cool. All right, well we, at the uh, every interview I do I, I, I let uh, people who watch the show The Metal Bar on our Facebook page know that I'm going to be talking to whoever it happens to be you guys in this case and ask them to give us some questions so I'm going to hit you with some questions from uh, The Metal Bar fans awesome okay uh, first one here um, Corey uh, Marsden asks uh, Matt how big have your ears stretched I always get asked that. I don't know the size you don't know no I'm not going to go any bigger uh but I don't know the size. Right. I think it's like five eighths or three quarters of an inch. I don't know. You stick your finger in it. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to know because I would like to get something different, but I don't know what it is. Get a, you can't quite get a chopper chunk through there yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I, unfortunately, I, I do not. I haven't stretched my ears, so this is just standard whatever they do. Initially. Just standard gear. Yep. Yeah. Speaking of, of gauges and things, uh, Jay, uh, Jake McNamara wants to know what brand and gauge of picks do you each use? Uh, uh, we both play Dunlop. I use. He uses jazz, jazz threes, threes, not XLs. Jazz little, little tiny picks. And With the grips, max yeah, grip. New, new product. Um, and I use the, I guess, like, I don't actually know the uh, thickness, but. Yeah, the green one. The green ones. The green it's ones. Like the, the, the well, they're the standard green ones, and then I usually get, like, custom picks made with, like, trivium artwork on it, but if you want to get the actual thickness, it's the green Tortex picks. Okay. I think they're all colored. The turtle, color. the green turtle one. The green yeah. turtle. All right, Jake, the green turtle is what you're after. Um, Christopher Esther Koning, Matt asks you what's life like now um, that you're married and how do you balance married and band life? I've, I've always kind of, I mean once once I met who was to become my wife I've pretty much always been like the old soul of the band I guess so I've always been used to it it's, it's just what you make of it I mean nowadays it's a lot easier to tour away from family than it used to be because before I guess you have to use pay phones and stuff but you know with that as laid dying guys all showed us that whatsapp application for the iphone and you can text off data and i think i've i've sent and received something like 1200 texts already within the last week and i, I think it uses like not even a meg right two megs yeah, wow it's, so yeah it's it's way easier and then you know uh, facetime and skype and iChat, and that's how you stay in touch with home and family and stuff cool cool and um, one last question which is actually from me um i know metallica has been a big influence in your your careers and or you know you were shaping your careers what you what were your personal thoughts on the death magnetic record um i uh i checked it out there's like you know it's, it's better than saying anger um, <laughs> i just i think they they did a really good job of you know getting back to like what made a metallic in the first place and i just wish they would get someone like colin or andy sneak to mix the shit out of those records because like that and like the new slayer albums if they were like you know had like the production quality of say like the new Megadeth or Exodus albums, they'd just be like brutal as shit. Yeah, I would, so I would love I wish, if I just, they went with Colin, if Metallica like, went to him. Yeah, I just yeah. wish like some of those bands, I think they could, the albums would probably, like there's good songwriting, but if you equal good, cool songs with, you know, killer modern production, it'll really, uh, you know, really adds to the listening experience, you know, and the average kid nowadays, everything they hear, like you can, you can make a really killer sounding record in like your bedroom, like on your laptop with Pro Tools and all the technology you have nowadays, so. It's uh, hopefully the production quality catches up on the next one, and just they just deliver something that's kind of like you know sonically crushing, like the Black album was. You know, it was like ahead of its time as far as you know album production for a metal CD. So hopefully they do that. Yeah, if they, if they if they did their next record with Colin Richardson, it would sound better than the Black album. 
So hopefully they hear that and do that. Uh, I'll <laughs> let them know. Yeah, they should definitely, definitely record Colin. That was an anonymous tip. Yeah, they, should, they gotta do it. <laughs> they gotta do it. I say Colin Richardson, produce, mix, master it. Uh, not, he doesn't master it, produce and mix. Yeah. Have sure. Colin do it, and it will, it will crush the Black Album. And crush. the Black Album is the best sounding metal record there is, so it'd be nice if they topped it. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. All right, hey man, Corey, Matt, thanks very much for coming Thank you along. very much. Awesome. Cheers. Thanks.